You're listening to the Really Useful Podcast. My name is Christian Corley and with me is Gavin Phillips. We are bringing you all the latest tech news that matters and tips <laughs> and tricks that will help you make the best use out of your technology. Gavin, how are you? Very well, Christian. Yes, very well, mate. Uh, it's been a, well, a bit of a wet and miserable <laughs> weekend, uh, considering the, the gloriousness it was the week before. But we went uh, strawberry picking at the weekend, which was very good. And uh, we went Loganberry picking at the weekend, which I don't know if you've ever had a, a Loganberry, but they are, they're really incredibly delicious. I don't think I've ever had Loganberry. Is that a th- Do they have Loganberries at Ikea? Uh, Ikea? Oh, I don't know. But they're I... sort of like between a, a, a blackberry and a raspberry. Mm. They're like a, a hybrid. And wow, they just taste phenomenal. I th- I'm getting an Ikea vibe from Logan Bros. I don't think I've had one, though. Um, I'm very sorry your weather wasn't good at the weekend uh, in the um, glorious southwest of the UK. It was absolutely beautiful here in the northeast UK. Nice. <laughs> Which makes a change. <laughs> Yeah, that's not going to happen again this year. Okay, (laughs) let's crack on with the tech news. Microsoft wants you to play Connect Four during Teams meetings. I can think of nothing better than to play Connect Four during a meeting. Um, Microsoft um, have confirmed to The Verge that they want to bring in a few fun treats to Microsoft Teams users, which includes casual games with which attendees can challenge one another when meeting when a meeting crawls on for too long. I mean, isn't that every meeting? Yeah, surely everyone's doing this already, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, in in you know face to face meetings, it might be I don't know doodling or a game of, game of hangman with the person next to you, or or that game. I don't know what that game is called. You know that game where you have dots and then you complete squares for your territory. Does that game oh, have a name? We always just knew it as as squares, but maybe it has an yeah, official name. Squares is good name as ever. Yeah, no, I really love that game, in fact, because it gets absurdly competitive towards the end. It does, doesn't it? <laughs> yes, yes. My my son is a very competitive young man, and uh, I, there are certain games that we don't play with him anymore, and that's one of them. <laughs> uh, <laughs> nice. uh, so, um, yeah, that's going to be happening, not just uh, Connect Four, but also Solitaire and Wordament. I'm not sure what Wordament is. It sounds a bit biblical. Uh, so they have Microsoft has a casual games library which includes Solitaire Collection, Wordmans, which is like letters on a grid that you make words with. I was being silly. Uh, Microsoft Sudoku, uh, Mayong, and various other things, which they could all potentially come along into into Teams, which is kind of cool. I can't help but thinking it's going to hit productivity if it's kind of you know not done on the down low, as it were. No, for sure. And there's always that awful moment where the meeting turns to you for you to give your, you know, part of the presentation or whatever. And it's over to you, Christian. Uh, uh, sorry, sorry, what? Who? Who? Uh, what? What? You sunk my <laughs> battleship! Oh, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, I don't know. Fun if it's there. I can't imagine too many bosses. But is it going to be something that's enabled by the user or is it going to be something that's enabled at an admin level? Because surely at an admin level, they'll go, well, clearly that's going to kill the productivity. So we'll just nerf that straight away. Yeah. Yeah, it probably will. I, I shouldn't imagine it not being killable by admin, but um, we will find out anyway. Uh, Microsoft Internet Explorer 11 is finally coming to an end on June the 15th. This is the um, the bane of many Internet users and Windows users over the years, Internet Explorer. Remember that version? I think it was Internet Explorer 6 where it was literally baked into the operating system and there's various things you couldn't do without having to use Internet Explorer 6 and you couldn't uninstall it. Absolutely. You try and open specific file types or complete the search within uh, I mean Windows 7 back then, I guess, and it would open Internet Explorer no matter what you did. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yes, it's um, it's been a bit of a thorn in the side of uh, Windows for many years, not just at the beginning, but certainly latterly as well when uh, it was replaced by Edge, but it was inexplicably still there. And I think a lot of this may be for corporate reasons where applications have been developed, like legacy applications developed back in the day that relied on early versions of Internet Explorer. I, I think I'm right in saying, does... Edge have an Internet Explorer mode? Oh, uh, I to be honest, Christian, I'm not 100% sure. I just came across this fact the other day, although I'm not oh. sure how 
how long that is around for or, or how good a, a mode it is. Yeah. But, yeah, it's coming to an end. The demise of Internet Explorer is no surprise, of course. Um, but uh, Microsoft have updated their Windows blogs and stated that Internet Explorer 11 will lose support on June the 15th, which is that that's the time to stop using it if you are still using it for some inexplicable reason. But the, the key word there, though, is that uh, whilst all the, the talk around this has been that it's coming to an end and it's going to disappear, it's actually the key word is that the end of support. So although it will technically disappear from your desktop and maybe the start menu and what have you, if you go and root around oh, yeah. in Windows 10 and Windows 11 still, it's still there. It's not being obliterated from the face of the operating system wholly like there's a lot of like christian just said you know it, there's a lot of stuff that actually still relies on certain parts of the internet explorer code to be up and running so microsoft can't just strike it down and delete it permanently absolutely and there was something about this that made me somewhat cross um on june the 15th the microsoft edge twitter account uh announced what I've just explained to you. Uh, to our predecessor, you helped the world explore the internet along with every facet of life. Now it's time to surf the big web in the sky and to demonstrate Internet Explorer. They're using an Amiga 2000 computer, uh, an, an Amiga 1000 computer. Uh, and, then they've, they, and then they've sort of like hijacked the monitor to dis display the Internet Explorer logo. And of course, Internet Explorer didn't run on the Amiga. No, uh, that's such a weird thing to do. The Amiga was um, the Amiga's lifespan was curtailed by uh, Microsoft and Microsoft Windows, and which uh, ninety five, which sold a lot thanks to Internet Explorer, despite the fact, of course, that uh, the Amiga operating system was kind of ten years ahead of Windows. It was doing what Windows ninety five did in like nineteen eighty five. But you know, everyone forgets about the superiority of the Amiga mm. these days. <laughs> Being bonnet there. Uh, thankfully released we'll move on microsoft defender has arrived on all your devices but it's gonna cost you money money we should have a ka-ching button on this you will need to subscribe to microsoft 365 before you can enjoy defender outside of a windows system now microsoft defender has this weird reputation doesn't it because it started off and it was terrible uh, back in windows 7 i think certainly windows 8 but over the years it's turned out to be a really good um, security software for Windows that comes free. And in many cases, unless, I mean, you know, most people don't need a third-party security suite these days because Windows Defender slash Microsoft Defender is adequate, more than adequate. It does the job almost perfectly. But if for some reason you wanted to extend protection to iOS, Android, or even macOS, you could but you would need a Microsoft 365 personal plan at $6.99 a month, which is $69.99 a year. I, um, I, I'm, I'm kind of spelled this. I can see it's been a good idea, and it certainly would make sense for businesses. I'm not sure why it's why personal users would do this, though. No, for sure. I, I mean, I guess most people are actually using microsoft windows already it's still the most popular operating system in the world so it's if you're using multiple computers i mean mac os has its own fairly well respected built-in security doesn't it so whether you would take that across to the to your other computers is, is i think it's questionable really um as you said though and as reported by our own simon bat the uh, the windows editor for make use uh, microsoft Defender is one of the best rated antivirus tools there are now. So if you are looking for a third party uh, antivirus suite, then at least you have all the additional stuff that comes with a Microsoft 365 subscription. So you get all your Microsoft Office tools and apps and a Microsoft um, what, cloud storage and all that sort of stuff. So it could work out slightly better deal than you would pay for a straight up third party uh, antivirus elsewhere we move to the point in the show now where we look at the tips and tricks that we can bring you that uh, can hopefully help you to make the better use out of your technology uh, your smartphone is your life in many cases and uh, you know you might not feel that 
attached to your smartphone. But uh, speaking realistically, if you have your social media accounts, your email accounts, your power apps, your banking apps, your credit card apps, all that stuff, if it's all on your phone, then yes, it is a bit. It is your life. Now, is it where you think it is? Is it in your bag? Is it in your pocket? Is it on your desk? Is it on the ledge over there near the TV? Or has it been stolen? If it has been taken, then there are things you can do later on, which we'll come to later on. First of all, you need to make sure that your phone is theft-proof. So either someone won't take it, or if they do, they can't get into it or use anything other than, you know, completely reset and delete everything from it and your information stays safe. So number one, set a pin, preferably biometric access. That means thumbprints. Uh, face recognition isn't reliable enough, so rely on fingerprint or thumbprints. Both possible on Android and iPhone. Number two, enable mobile tracking services. They can either be those provided by Android or iOS or third party such as Prey or Kerberos. Number three, install an anti-theft app on your phone. Again, that might include one of those apps. Uh, there are other things. There is uh, one from McAfee called McAfee Mobile uh, Security, which does a few extra things beyond tracking. You should also have insurance that covers phone theft. It's not going to stop your phone being stolen, but it's going to help you get another phone. You can use anti-theft phone cases and phone armbands that will prevent your phone from being on show. Or if it is on show, prevent someone from taking it at least without also being down from an assault charge because they've yanked it from your neck or whatever. <laughs> and uh, also, if you are, you know, if you're in a car, leave your phone and any related paraphernalia out of sight because if people see phones or phone charges or docks or windshield mounts or earpods through your car window, then they're going to take the opportunity to steal them. Um, which not only means losing some tech, it also means you've got some glass to sort out and an insurance company call to make and it's going to slow down your day considerably. Um, there are various things you can do when approached by thieves. This covers everything, not just um, not just carrying a phone around. So if, for instance, someone might um, ask you for the time, the natural response will be to look for the nearest clock, which might be your phone. Um, but picking your phone out of your pocket in front of someone who wants to take your phone is basically handing it to them. So, you know, take care, beware of that. And if you're approaching a bus or phone, you know, sorry, if you're approaching a bus or a train, stay aware of your surroundings and keep your phone out of sight and anyone attempting to steal in those scenarios. Um, they're going to look elsewhere or give up. Now, um, I did mention there are other things to do at the beginning of this and I've forgotten what the topic was. What did I say? It's going to be a great edit. No, I, I can't remember. <laughs> Uh, what to do with this or, the now if your phone is stolen um then there are various things you can do check out show notes for the details on that because you know if you've lost your phone then you, there are trash kitting apps that you can use but there's also things you can do such as um remotely wipe the phone set off an alarm take photographs of people who have your phone that sort of thing and um it, it's um it can turn into a bit of a game actually um, which I think, I don't know what the figures are, but I think mobile phone thefts have dropped a bit um, since uh, Apple and Android have both sort of upped their game with phone security. I certainly feel a bit more secu uh, confident about having my phone out in public these days with things like thumbprint readers. Things like that definitely make it much harder to to access a phone as, as well. Uh, there's also things like Apple are really good and really on it with blacklisting phones from the app store and stuff, yeah. aren't they? Yeah. Which means effectively within, you know, an hour of someone stealing your phone, it, it just becomes a worthless brick. So uh, I'm sure that mobile phone theft is still fairly prevalent, but uh, I guess it more depends on sort of your area or what have you. But yeah, with things like that in mind, and especially with the fact that, you know, it can be quite hard to sell a phone if if it can literally do nothing. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so uh, we'll move on from that to touch screens and tablets primarily. Some of this applies to phones, but it's mostly for tablets. And what happens when they don't work properly? Um, do you remember my old tablet shenanigans? 
What the the Samsung one? The Samsung one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I still <laughs> use that tablet. It's I've, it's now worked longer since being repaired than it did before being repaired when the screen inexplicably stopped working. Which is good because uh, I don't like spending too much money on expensive tablets very often. But how did they repair it in the end? Because did you, did you send it off in the end? No, they came out and <clears> did it. They they came uh, on a couple of occasions. The first time they came with the wrong gear. Um, not completely <laughs> the wrong gear. So there's there's sort of, you know what it's like with tablets, with Samsung tablets or any Android tablets. Basically, there's very intricate differences between the same devices in the same range of models, <laughs> and uh, they brought the wrong display. So they have a sort of a what they call a doorstep service. I'm not sure if they still have it, where they send someone out in a van and they'll repair it in their van and then hand it back over to you. So they intended to do that on two occasions. First occasion, they couldn't do it because they had the wrong kit. Um, I think on a second occasion, they couldn't come. So then it got postponed to a third occasion where eventually, where fa- thankfully it was repaired. Uh, although I, I, don't, I don't think it got sent away. I can't remember because I had a problem with one of my computers at the same Similar sort of time, so it's difficult to say, really. But, uh, yeah, gener- generally speaking, that is uh, what happened. It went wrong. Uh, it stopped responding correctly. But that was more about the display than the touchscreen. Now, if you're having problems with your touchscreen, if it doesn't respond, there's several things that you... Um, there's several reasons for this. First of all, you might have dropped it or knocked the screen, which I think is what happened with mine. Or what happened with mine was you dropped or jarred the tablet, and that affected the cable connecting the digitizer to the main board, resulting in display and responsiveness issues. On the other hand, it could just be dirt, dust or hair confusing the touchscreen, so give it a good clean down. Uh, scratches and cracks can also reduce touchscreen reliability. Now, you can use screen protector to keep your touchscreen safe. Uh, you can keep it in a tablet, tablet case with a soft interior, but then again, that's what I do, and still, it had problems. Uh, you can also avoid placing your tablet face down on hard surfaces, as tiny, even the tiniest bits of dirt, even, even salt can cause scratches in the display, which can then result in responsiveness issues. Uh, I'm going to go quickly through the seven things you can do to uh, alleviate touchscreen problems. The first one is to make more RAM available. The second is to restart the tablet. Number three, you can fix your tablet when it doesn't respond to touch by using a different device. So if it isn't working, when you're touching it, it's not responding, how do you troubleshoot it? Well, you connect a mouse. Um, certainly with the Android devices, that is straightforward with an OTG adapter. Connect a mouse to that, then start whizzing around because mouse, uh, mouse support is included in Android. You can use system apps to detect unresponsive touchscreen areas as well. So for instance, uh, you could use a map app and then uh, you know, work out what part of the display is working and what isn't. So where you can move your finger around to and zoom in and stuff, pinch to zoom, that sort of thing. Number five, you can calibrate your tablet's touchscreen. You can use third-party apps on Android, and I think there's a calibration tool built into iOS. Uh, Windows 10 also has a built-in calibration tool if for some reason you're using Windows 10 on a tablet. Then we get to the really big, big guns. You can call an engineer to fix your tablet, or you can even attempt a repair yourself to realign the tablet display. Now, the details of all of these things I've just described are a little bit in depth so they will be included in the show notes so you can check it out and uh, go into the details yourself without us uh, recording basically another podcast here as i go through them all (laughs) i was just going to add that uh bluetooth mouse support was added to ipad os 13.4 at the start of january 2021 oh god didn't realize 24 21 2021 that's apple terrible apple, always their dynamic <laughs> cutting <defense. in> edge <laughs> exactly <laughs> <laughs> We reached that part of the show in which we discuss recommendations. What have Gavin and I enjoyed separately, presumably, uh, technologically based over the past seven days since the last show? Uh, Gavin, do you want to go first or shall I? I can go first if you like, Christian. Oh, go on then. Okay, so, <clears throat> excuse me. I, uh, this week, have very much been enjoying the HyperX Cloud Alpha wireless gaming headset. Uh, and I tell you why I've been enjoying this so much, uh, and it's its battery life, which it has a 300-hour battery life, 
which how long? Three hundred hours of battery life. What's what's which, that in days? Uh, like two 10, weeks. 12, 12 odd days. Is, heck. It genuinely is very very impressive. I've been using the same headphones now uh, for maybe nine days or so, with a good you know five hours or so a day. And whenever I pick them up and turn them on, it says your battery life is at 90%. <laughs> like, wow. Surely. Is it, is it drawing power from your body? What's going on? Yeah, or maybe. Maybe there's like secret solar panels in it or something <laughs> that like, I'm not aware of. Uh, or like piezoelectric plating. So whenever I move my head when I'm rocking out, it's yes. charging up. Um, but overall, aside from the 300 hours of battery life, which is like, it's just way above anything else on the market you'll find, honestly. It's crazy. Uh, they sound fantastic as well. They've got a really, really nice balanced sound. Slightly, slightly turned up in the bassy end of stuff, but like not overwhelming. Uh, and they're an extremely comfortable wear as well, which is like, if you're going to wear a set of headphones for 300 hours, you want them to be really comfortable whilst you do it. So... You know, that is my suggestion for this week. Check them out. Excellent. Uh, Gavin and I were discussing the thing that I'm about to uh, recommend uh, early, before we start recording the podcast. And uh, although it isn't perfect, I am going to recommend it because I've enjoyed using it. And there is a review on Make Use Of for it, which I will link to in the show notes. It is the eScoot Paluno City e-bike, which is a electric bike, uh, the pedal assisted type that is designed for uh, urban and suburban transport rather than uh, mountain biking, cross country, that sort of thing. It's a nice ride, and uh, I'm a little bit. It's the, the instruction manual isn't perfect and it omits a few things, but it is really nice to ride, and I haven't had a bike that suits my frame for many, many years. So it's a uh, it's it's a good bike. I've been whizzing around town on it, and. Um, Driving along the riding along the side of the beach and up under up under bridges and over bridges, you know you can't do too much with. As I say, it's not an off road bike. It will it feels like it's going to fall apart if you even ride on grass too quickly. <laughs> but um, I mean, it's not. It's just it's got very good suspension. That's why you get that sort of judder thing going on. But uh, no, it's it's a good bike. I really enjoyed riding it. Which I think was part of the. If you if you're not enjoying riding a bike, you probably shouldn't be riding a bike, should you? No, for sure. But I think like, like with the advent of e-bikes, it's getting a lot of people back out and on them. So what, what's the battery like uh, life like on it? It is. It, uh, it's a good question. I'm glad you asked me that because I haven't. Uh, uh, it's it's uh, four to six hours and it should do. It has a range of a battery range of 65 miles. So um, but you, you kind of it doesn't it doesn't have a good sort of uh, standby. So you do need to keep it topped up overnight. Uh, OK, cool. Yeah, that sounds really good though. So like perfect for whizzing in and out of town. Bit of shopping as well and stuff. Well, it's got a um, it's got one of them clampy saddle bag things on the back, so you could probably you know if you got panniers, um, bags, put them on there or whatever else. You could probably put a child on the back as well. Um, I think. I mean, it, I mean, it's perfect for shopping. If assuming you're shopping for one and not for a huge family, I suppose. Um, I think. What I really wanted to do is commute with it, but I mean, my commute is sort of 30 feet, so um, <laughs> I couldn't. And I did have this idea of uh, riding it to Middlesbrough, which is a sort of, I mean, that's a 25 mile round trip, I think, or 18 mile round trip, something like that. Um, but I wasn't able to because of the weather it was absolutely atrocious while I was reviewing the bike, so I had to keep. I basically had to take my opportunity to run out when the sun was shining and there wasn't too much water on the floor. <laughs> um, but I really would have liked to find out what it was like doing a proper commute with it. Um, but, I mean, I, I did a similar sort of distance around around my hometown. So I think I've got a good feel of uh, how good it is for that. And it, it, it's just a good ride. So um, that sort of I'm not necessarily that particular bike model. Certainly check it out. Um, but certainly if you... If you are thinking of um, buying an electric car to uh, cheapen your commute, I would suggest maybe look at an electric bike first because it'll save yeah. you a bit of money. Yeah, ideal. Yeah, And it's all good for the environment regardless, so good stuff. Well, that brings us to the end of this week's really useful podcast. 
from makeuseof.com. As mentioned, everything that we've discussed, you can find in the show notes that accompany this podcast. Uh, if you find anything useful, please share the show with your friends and family or just with your followers on Twitter, if you have such a thing, or on Facebook or wherever. And if you have anything that you'd like us to cover in the show, please let us know. We'll be back next time. Until then, it's goodbye.